Welcome to the AI PMM webinar series. Today's episode is Becoming the Social Product Manager. The AI PMM is available on the web at www.aipmm.com. It is the Association of International Product Marketing and Management. You can follow them on Twitter at AIPMM. The AIPMM was founded in 1998. It is the largest product management professional group, providing professional development, certification credentials, and opportunities to advance your career. With the certification opportunities as certified product manager, certified product marketing manager, agile certified product manager, and certified innovation leader, giving you opportunities to demonstrate your expertise. I am Cindy F. Solomon, delighted to be your moderator for this series. I founded the Global Product Management Talk, which is a podcast on the Blog Talk Radio Network at blogtalkradio.com slash P-R-O-D-M-G-M-T-T-A-L-K. Also, you can follow at startupproduct.com to find webcasts and additional information, including upcoming webinars. I'm delighted to present Ed Brill, who is the Director of Social Business and Collaboration Solutions at IBM. You can follow him on Twitter at Ed Brill. And go to his LinkedIn profile listed here. So Ed Brill is at E-D-B-R-I-L-L. AIPMM is at AIPMM. Product Management Talk, the Monday broadcast, is at P-R-O-D-M-G-M-T-T-A-L-K. And if you are tweeting, the standard hashtag for product management events and discussions is POM, P-R-O-D-M-G-M-T. Please keep your chat window open. I will be posting pertinent information in your chat box and use your questions box to post questions that you'd like to ask Ed. And also, uh, you're welcome to make comments, which I will read to Ed. And, and also, we may be having polls, so pay attention so you can participate in the polls. The most active participants will be entered into a drawing to win a free copy of Ed's new book, Opting In, Lessons in Social Business from a Fortune 500 Product Manager. And I'd like to introduce Ed and have you take it away. All right, great. Thank you, Cindy, and welcome everyone to uh, this webinar. Um, I'm, I'm excited about the opportunity we have here today to talk about the intersection of being a product manager and becoming a social business. And I think that the the opportunity that lies ahead on this conversation is to help you as a product manager or offering manager or brand manager or marketing manager uh, to understand why the social media tools that you're probably familiar with, probably how you even heard about this webinar today, are relevant to you in your, in your job every single day, um, how you can become a social product manager. I, I don't get paid by the, the, the drink every time I use that expression, but it's the, the notional idea of a product manager who's using social business tools to advance their self, their product, and their company um, to find out how that is defined in the market, um, how you as an individual product manager can use these tools to affect your market and your opportunity. Um, we'll talk about what some of the best tools are and some of the risks as well and uh, some evolutionary stuff. So um, uh, a pretty good uh, agenda of things that I hope you will find useful in the context of being a product or offering or brand manager every day. And um, of course, we're here to, to take questions, talk about it in the context of uh, my new book, Opting In, which somebody on this call will win. And hopefully more of you will find uh, useful enough in terms of content and opportunity that you'd like to participate in. 
Uh, at some point pretty early here, Cindy, whenever you, you want to, we should probably poll the audience to find out who's actually with us today, what the, the demographic of roles are um, within, the, within the, the audience that we have. And I'll just uh, start jumping into the questions that we're going to answer today. Uh, great. If you want to hold on, I will launch the poll. And we need to give some time for people to vote on what okay. is your role, whether it's product manager, brand manager, marketing manager, community manager, slash social, or other. And often we have a lot of project managers that join us. We didn't spell out product marketing manager, but that would fall under marketing manager. Right, and a lot of different roles. Yes, so 76% have voted. Let's give them another 30 seconds. Coming up to 80%. Voting. <laughs> okay, if you just came in, please vote. Two more seconds and I will close the polls. 92% have voted. And I am closing the polls. And if you uh, wait one more minute, I can share the results. Okay, the results okay. are that 67% of the attendees are indeed product managers. Yay! There are no brand managers attending today. Okay. Um, there, four percent are marketing managers, four percent are community managers, but twenty-five percent are other. And okay, I would. Um, Should I say hi to my mom then? I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Is your mom on? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, in the other, I, I would presume um, that they're developers, they're uh, CEOs, they're founders, there are other, other people involved with product or certainly interested in the subject. Yep. Okay, cool. Great. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's jump into a couple of these topics then, um, starting with what is this notion of a social product manager? What is that? Who is that? Do I want to be one? How can I be one? And the answer to the question of what is a social product manager is a product manager who understands the value of participation. And when I say participation, what I'm really thinking about there is engaging both uh, externally in the market as well as internally within their organization to connect to undiscovered information and experts to discover and leverage new relationships to capture uh, and reuse content, and to therefore, with all of that, execute uh, better business decisions. So um, the idea is that um, product managers definitely live in a, in a role where uh, connections and influence and networking is very important. Uh, oftentimes, product managers don't have line of sight direct responsibility over the people that they need to influence, even within their organization and certainly outside the organization, whether that's customers or uh, ecosystem channel partners or uh, analysts or press or even competitors. Um, but participation uh, provides a, a, a metaphor and an idea around how all those relationships can be leveraged in a way that makes for better decision making. I certainly think in my time as a product manager that many of the decisions that we made where in the past we relied on or waited for formal market research or studies or things that took a long time to validate and get uh, input from the market by participating, by leveraging undiscovered information and experts, by leveraging relationships. We made faster and better decisions um, and also evolved much more quickly. So um, I think that, that that's the, the core notion of, of what a social product manager should be about. So, um, marry that concept then with what is a social business. So we at IBM, we talk about this notion of a social business a lot. A lot of people hear social business and they think, well, is that just social media with a different name on it? And uh, it sort of is, but a social business is a, a, an organization that's leveraging the tools and techniques of social media in all of the company's processes, both internal and external. Um, phrased a little bit differently, it's about inserting people into process 
and connecting people to people uh, and people to information. So most of you should be familiar with the the stats and the, the background that's on the, the slide here of um, how people are empowered in organizations, customers are empowered, uh, organizations are empowered. Um, what we found at IBM is we see that the buying journey for customers has changed dramatically to where uh, it used to be that what we hoped for is to drive people to our website, have them start at our website by reading some information about a product, and then enter the buying process funnel with us. Today, most people's buying journey actually starts with a search and they search on Google or wherever for information and they land and they choose to land on a human content or curated content. They don't go to the company's website. They don't march in our front door anymore saying, here's what I want to buy. They go and they learn. They learn from other humans. They find that information that's been created through social networking on a lot of different platforms. And what we ultimately hope and want is to engage them in such a way that that then ultimately leads to our front door and leads to them as a better educated or ready to buy kind of consumer. So um, the, the, the hope and the idea is to engage those empowered people in a way that helps uh, foster advocacy and excitement about your products and offerings in the market. So a social business though is not necessarily just a whole bunch of people talking at or with each other. There's this notion people think about how do I bring social media into my business environment and uh, I somehow have to turn everybody into talkers. Um, Forrester has done this research for several years. I used to use a, uh, actually a 2008 version of this and they, I saw that they've updated it in 2011. Um, but this ladder of participation around social uh, shows that especially um, uh, with some geographic differences, you know, only really a third of all people in organizations are going to participate. Most people are going to view, visit, read, absorb as spectators or joiners, but you don't have to have everybody talking to have a social business. And so this notion of a social business is that by bringing out the conversations, making them exposed and accessible, getting them out of people's inboxes and out into shared places, you can build the knowledge and the, the, the culture of participation within your organization without having to have everybody actually feel like they have to be a participator, if that's a verb. So um, being part of a, a social business doesn't mean I got to sit here and tweet all day. It means that I got to learn from the conversations happening with customers. Um, we could ask the next question, Cindy, the policy question. That would be good leading up into this next section. Okay. Does your company have a social media policy? Yes or no? And the votes are coming in. Okay, I'm going to close the polls as 87% have voted and I will show you, I'm posting the results. So 59% said no and 41% wow. said yes. Okay, so that's a, good, that's a good number to know because I think that one of the keys to participation and how an individual product manager can be influencing in the market through being a social product manager is having a policy in place in their organization that encourages that participation and, and gets the product manager engaged in the market. Uh, we at IBM in 2005 set out to write what was then a set of blogging guidelines and we've since turned them into our social media uh, or social computing guidelines. In that time, in eight years, we've actually only had to update them a couple of times. Um, but it's a, a policy document that's unlike any other in the whole company because it's one that was written to encourage activity rather than set boundaries. So most people think about company policy as something that tells you what you can't do, what you shouldn't do, what you should stay away from. 
the social computing guidelines at IBM, which are published as Appendix A in the book, but are also publicly available on IBM.com, uh, were written to tell people, we want you to do this. We want you engaged in the market. We want you talking to customers. We want you talking to the ecosystem. We want you to feel comfortable that as you, long as you're factual and as long as you're representing you know, individual thought, that you're, you're supported, you're backed by the company. We want you to engage in doing this. And so that authentic voice, that notion of engaging and having something unique to say that a product manager has all the time, right? Just as you do when you're presenting at a conference or you're meeting with a customer, the things that you as a product manager say are the things that you uniquely add value to a conversation with. You're the only person in your organization who knows this stuff. Certainly, you're the expert in front of your customers and partners. <clears throat> so we wrote this policy trying to bring those voices out. We wanted to encourage everybody at IBM who had something unique to say to say it. Um, and to feel comfortable that they could do that on blogs, on LinkedIn, on Facebook, on Twitter, on whatever new service emerges, and also inside the company, where we have an implementation of a tool that we wrote internally called Connections that we sell and actually leads the market and social, um, so that people participated. So this chart that I put up, it's the, the, the individual names are obviously not so important. Maybe some of my colleagues at IBM are kind of wondering why I've put their names on this chart. This is actual real-world data, and I thought it was better to show real-world than to mock it up. We actually are tracking uh, activations on our website, conversions, from offers that we make. So click here to enroll and get this white paper or enroll and get this download uh, on IBM.com. And we're tracking all the different ways that people come in that door to participate in that activity. Um, you know, how do they get to IBM.com? How, how many initiate something there? How many complete it there? How many then convert to buying something as a result of that? And what we found is that the humans that are curating content through blogs or other um, channels, such as Twitter or Facebook, are bringing us more, uh, more active leads into the website than any other method, than like our e-newsletters or just having the link available in search engine and optimizing it. By having curated content, by having product managers, and almost every name on this list is a product manager um, engaged in the market, those sites, the, wherever that product ma manager is living, are providing that entry point to IBM that people want to take advantage of. So um, their buying journey starts with human curated content that they trust because that product manager has engaged in the market with their authentic voice. They're talking about something that they and only they can say that then ultimately leads to something that then triggers the, the buyer to want to do something with IBM. Now, on the back end of that process, we've also, through product manager engagement, made our sales force more successful. We did a study. The study is not published externally, but we did a study. It's in the book as well. Uh, in 2012, where we had researchers from Rutgers and Duke study our inside sales organization and looked at whether the people in inside sales who were participating through social tools, through social networking, both internally and externally, whether or not they were more effective than the inside salespeople who were not. And they found that the inside salespeople who use the tools identified more re revenue by 11% than those don't. That the specialists, a per particular product person who utilized the tools, were closing 26% more business than those who don't. And that by increasing their internal reputation, that these sellers could increase their re results by 2 to 6%, which in a company of $100 billion like IBM. That's, that can be big money. So why is this relevant to the product manager? Because what was happening or what is happening in our inside sales organization is that those people who typically had to worry about how do I find information now have the entire company standing behind them providing information to them right at the front line. And then in turn, the stuff that they're providing at the front line is getting amplified out to the market to where other customers and partners are finding that information as well. So the engagement of the entire ecosystem of the company, the whole value chain of sales and marketing and product management development behind the salespeople is making them more effective. And then the engagement out to the market in turn is making them more effective as well. So um, you know, what I found personally is that a whole bunch of our salespeople um, were able to find more information about my products by being able to engage with me through internal forums or discussions or communities or get access to my files without ever having to know me. And 
that's a really good thing in a big company. You want to have those informal connections, that participation going on without having to build the networks or the rigid structures to formally share it. So then here's the, the reference to the social computing guidelines written in 2005-2006. Um, I and several others participated in that effort. And then we went back and got legal and HR and finance and everybody else to buy in. Provides both permission and direction, and of course it clarifies roles. And there's a link so that if you're interested in checking that out, um, you have the opportunity to, to do so. Um, yeah, let's ask the, the next polling question, Cindy. Okay. Are you personally actively discussing your product service through social media? And the poll is open and the votes are coming in. So it's interesting that you put together that document and then presented it to legal and HR and didn't bring them in uh, <laughs> at the <laughs> beginning. That that was very, yes. very smart. Yeah, well, we thought that if we took the people who were already doing it, the practitioners in the market, and brought them together first and said, here's what we would say if we could do it, that we might come up with a great policy that then didn't really need a lot of corporate blessing to make it successful, and that's how it happened. Right, and you were also educating the people in those other departments who, who aren't as attuned. Right, that's right. And, and that is an issue in, in some industries that are regulated, uh, such as pharmaceuticals and um, health, that they're, they're more constricted. Yep, that's right. So, so one we of, have people... Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have people who are actively discussing social media, through social media on this call, or they're here to learn? So, so um, there are some comments uh, coming in through questions, and one of them um, was uh, saying that where where they work, posting internally is not an issue. Um, it's actually open and encouraged. However, for posting externally, they have a defined group, and only that group can post externally. Yeah, I, I, I see that a lot. And I think that that is often a sort of marketing-driven culture. It's a idea that we have to stay on message, and therefore only a few people can do it. And I think that that, honestly, I think is, is a little short-sighted. I think that the, the authentic voice that could be established by having product managers or developers or architects or, you know, depending on your industry, you know, the thought leaders in general be part of the conversation um, you know, could be much more valuable in terms of establishing the eminence and expertise of the, the, the company and what your unique differentiators are. So I would encourage whoever asked that question to see if there's an opportunity to influence in their organization, because I'm sure that they don't stop their product managers from speaking at conferences or going to talk to customers or occasionally talking to maybe the media or analysts, and that social should just be looked at as another channel for that um, ability to demonstrate their expertise. Yeah, yeah. Um, so they're agreeing with you. They're saying they're here to learn about social media, and their company happens to be a, a holding company for a very large educational institution. Okay. Uh, so okay. the voting has come in. I'm closing the okay. poll, and the results are that 63% are not actively discussing their product and service through social media, and 37% are. And okay. I will tell you that I started the product management talk, what's now a broadcast, started as a Twitter chat for product managers. And I found product managers are too busy to to learn <laughs> uh, social tools that are, that are outside their direct or and that they perceive to be outside their direct um, focus. I understand. And, and actually, it's a good setup for this next slide. That's why we did that question here, is maybe the answer in some cases is not that you yourself have to do this, but that you need to build a sort of army of people to do it for you. And we've done both at IBM, right? So we have some people internally that are very, very active and advocate and speak and tweet and whatever. But then we also have established a programmatic form of identifying people in the market who are 
essentially, um, you know, the people who are advocating for us. And, you know, it's a two-way street. It's not like we're just taking advantage of a bunch of people who happen to like our products. Um, but we established this IBM Champions program. It's in place in a lot of different parts of IBM. There's probably four or 500 people uh, around the world that have been identified as champions. None of them work for IBM. They tend to be customers of ours or business partners or channel partners. And they're nominated by their peers. They're nominated by people who know them into a process annually at IBM that identifies and, and then validates and selects such people. And we give them this designation of a champion, which they can use anytime that they're speaking or blogging or tweeting or, you know, whatever. It can be all over their profile, their resume. And so they get, you know, some validation of their effort. And in turn, what we give them access to is uh, early access to information. So uh, I have a conference coming up at the end of April. And so about a week before, we'll do a briefing for champions to tell them what we're going to announce at the conference. That way, by the time they get to the conference, they can already have established in their mind what they want to say and how they want to interact with people about that news, sort of further building their reputation and credibility. Uh, we bring them into beta programs or in the software that we make. We bring them into early lab tours or you know, discussions about new products. So we really look at them as a focus group, but one that's identified and then in turn is part of an uh, ecosystem of amplifying our messages. And so um, it's a two-way street. And, uh, most of the champions, I think, if you were to look at them, say that there is a, a huge benefit by being identified as part of this program. And the obvious benefit to us at IBM is that we have independent voices talking about our products positively in a way that is much more credible even than I as a product manager could do because they don't work for IBM. So I was at a conference a week ago in uh, Belgium that was for one of our products. And uh, of the 76 speakers that they had at the conference, 18 were IBM champions. And they were very, very vocal about identifying that as such uh, on the, the materials for the conference. They were very proud to have um, that level of champion participation in the event. Um, so another v a vector on that where, you know, if you can or can't participate or you're trying to think about, well, what's some places to start, I think one of the, the important questions that gets asked a lot is, well, where do I go? What do I do? What do I use? What are the tools? And the answer is to go where the customers are. So too often we think about, well, uh, we want to drive our activity to bring them back to our website. Well, you know, that's not how marketing's done. Marketing's about insertion. So you have to think about going where the customer is, where the community is, where people want to hear your messages. And so building community um, through those advocates or through your own actions is, is definitely an a, a important approach. Now, one of the products that I've worked with over the years, whether you like it or not, is Lotus Notes, a um, product that's 24 years old in the market, just shipped version 9 last week, still has a 50,000 customer base, is a 30% plus market share holder in the market, and um, has changed a lot if you haven't used Notes in many years and have some old impression of it. Um, it's kind of like, uh, you know, Office or Windows uh, software products that have been around a long time. People think about them differently. But we've built a lot of communities around that. And so um, there's a, a website that aggregates hundreds of people that blog about uh, IBM Notes and Domino. And so bringing them together was an instant formation of a community. And so people who didn't know each other all over the world suddenly work with each other on building um advocacy for this product, uh, you know, amongst each other and helping them be more successful with using the product. Uh, only a few of the names that you see here are IBM employees. Most of them are uh, people in this community. So, um, you know, that's the kind of uh, way to sort of foster the participation without having to necessarily be the voice on your own. Another is to use the social tools more for inbound. And so um, uh, one of my business partners is a company called El Gucci, and they have a, a solution called Idea Jam. This notion of ideation or crowdsourcing is a great way to build uh, improvements and ideas for your product in the future. So if you're not in technology, and I'm sure some of you are not, uh, a better example might be mystarbucksidea.com. happens to not be built on IBM technology even, so uh, I'm happy to just talk about it conceptually. Um, my Starbucks idea is a site that Starbucks uses to get ideas for new products that they can offer in their stores. And you can see from this uh, graphic on the left, and this is a few months old now already, that you know somewhere on the order of 80 or 90,000 ideas, maybe it's even 100,000 now, have come in through mystarbucksidea.com. 
And that's cut back on their, their need to come up with the best ideas internally. Um, if you've ever gone through a drive through at Starbucks and you get the little green tab that they put in the lid to make sure that it doesn't spill out the drinking hole, that idea came through mystarbucksidea.com. It didn't come through their internal research. So, um, you know, one way to use social tools, even if you have a policy against using them, is to get your customers to talk amongst themselves and give you the best ideas and the best input for what you can do with your products and services. Um, another is around sharing. So here's a social tool that it doesn't matter whether I can tweet or blog, but one of the things I can do is take presentations that I've delivered and share them out on SlideShare or other similar sites or YouTube or you know, the like. So how do we get our marketing materials out onto social sites so that we can bridge the gap and then more importantly, use them as channels to get feedback so it's not just enough to say, okay, well, I'm going to put my slides out on SlideShare. That'll just make them more pervasive. It's I'm going to watch who likes them and who's commenting on them and try to glean information from that and then use that to then build my army of advocates. So you have to look at these tools, which you often probably think about as just one way outbound, as being uh, you know, sort of two-way streets that you can bring information back to you. And we, for example, always make sure that they lead back to something on IBM.com where we can activate an offer. And then back on IBM.com, we've also inserted human experts into some of our web pages. Um, this was a, a major barrier breakdown within IBM where we used to think about the company as sort of a faceless entity where you know, the customer's face of IBM was their salesperson and nobody else. And we started to put humans on our website. And if you go to IBM.com slash software today, towards the bottom of the page, you'll see five or six experts that we've highlighted on that page, for example. The idea is we want customers who want to engage with IBM to have a way to do that. We want them to know who we are, even if they don't know who we are. And so, again, you know, it could just be to connect on LinkedIn, which presumably every company allows you to do that. Um, but it's a way to connect. And then the offline conversations become really, really interesting, right? It's not about so much how many people I'm talking to on my Facebook page, but how many of those people feel comfortable enough to email me offline and say, here's a sales opportunity that you may not know about, do you want to get involved in it? That's happened hundreds of times over the last 10 years where the, the conversation offline has become valuable because of the trust built online. Excuse me, Ed. Yep. Um, yes. A tactical question. So yes. is there a specific person or group monitoring so the social presence at IBM? Yes, there is. Um, we do have a sort of a, a, a digital strategy team that sits in our corporate organization, and they do analysis and monitor participation across IBM. So if you go to ibm.com slash voices, that's run by this digital strategy team. And there they're highlighting sort of the people who are the best at what they do in engaging in the conversation. And so we're trying to do a lead by example there, right? We're trying to highlight the people who are doing it right as a a model for others to follow. We know that not everybody's going to feel comfortable engaging in the conversation or that they won't have the confidence necessarily to have a unique, authentic voice right at the outset. But if we can sort of show by example how people are doing it right, we'll get more and more people to do it. Great. Thanks. Okay. That was a good question. So, um, so let me go on to some risks because I know that there's some, some downsides or concerns that people have about how do I use social business and make myself more effective as a product manager. There are some blind spots. There are some things that, that can trip you up in terms of engaging in the social marketplace. So as much as I advocate participation and engagement and authentic voice, there's some things you have to worry about. Um, I think this is chapter nine in my book is kind of the risks, nine or ten. Um, you can sort of reach unintended audiences. A message that you intend just to reach a primary set of influencers might get amplified in the mainstream. So I often apply the good old PR rule of, do I want this appearing on the front page of the Wall Street Journal or not when I publish something on my blog or on a tweet or whatever. There's a lot of subset populations. Uh, a lot of conversation uh, might, you might think takes place in English. But yet, you know, there's a whole market in China or in uh, the Middle East or in Africa that, that isn't engaging in that conversation at all. Uh, Japan is 10% of the market for my primary product, and yet it's less than 1% of the hits to my blog. Uh, it's just not a culture of participation in the same way. So the demographics, the languages, um, you know, sometimes get in the way. 
emotion. Emotion is a, a real risk factor in using social. Always has been the flame war, the troll, the whatever. Um, and so you open yourself up to that a little bit um, when you start to engage humans with humans is not everybody's going to always like each other. Sometimes it's like a family, right? It's a family in good ways. It's a family in bad ways. So you have to think about the emotions and how to best govern your own personal emotion as you engage and build relationships and talk to people in the market. Um, identity challenges and imitations. This is, uh, you know, there's a Twitter ID that's the fake Ed Brill. I don't know what I did to be important enough to attract a fake. Um, but, uh, you know, I have to just sort of accept the fact that somebody's decided a little parody at my expense would be fun. Um, most of the time, I kind of look at it as it's building my reputation. So that's fine. And then uh, another interesting risk, and it sounds like it's one that's come up in questions already today, is the internal issues of disclosure and attention and priorities. How do I have time to do this? And um, how do I make sure that my team's on board? When we first started building the product uh, called IBM Notes version 8, our developers actually took to a blog to sort of talk about user interface design and things that they wanted to do. Others at IBM didn't really want to support that. They didn't think that was a good idea to have the conversation externally about things we were going to put in a product in the future. But it broke new ground, and now um, sort of user-driven design is a, a core discipline at IBM. So uh, we can definitely change the culture through things that we do in social. Okay. So then I think the last of these questions is, you know, sort of where does product management go in the future through the use of social business? And I think the answer is leadership. Um, Every organization, every product manager that I've talked to, their organization structured differently. Sometimes the product management team has direct responsibility over resources, and sometimes they're just an influence manager. Um, but I think in the future, because of social tools, that that will align more directly. We're doing this right now at IBM, we're trying to teach our product management execs to think of themselves as mini general managers. They may not have the authority, the spending budget, the people reporting to them, but they're running the business. So how do you be more aligned with the business and oversight? I think that that's going to happen more in the future. Um, I think in the future, we'll align more with all markets, languages, and cultures, that the technology will become better to do that over time. And then at the same time, we'll be more selective about how to reach audiences and not just always look at social as a, a broadcast mechanism. And then last, I think that a product manager has to think about both inbound and outbound. So outbound is kind of the mindset of social, but you have to also think about how do I aggregate and take all the conversations that are having, happening about my product and service, bring them back into the organization to make better decisions. So we should probably ask the um, last polling questions. Okay. Which is, what is the biggest barrier to your successful use of social business tools? And the poll is open. And the options are policy, time, confidence, or having something to say, which I would call content. coming in. I am closing the poll. And here are the responses. So the biggest barrier by far is having something to say. That was 44%. The next okay. one was time, 28%. Time is a barrier. Uh, then policy was a barrier for 16%. And confidence was a barrier for 12%. And I will s say that I've seen uh, for myself that there is a uh, learning curve in identifying which are the best tools, how to use the tools, having confidence, and then identifying, you know, strategically what is appropriate to say when. Yep. Yep. You have to really think about that, right? You know, are you on offense or defense? Are, are you you know, to use a vernacular, out to pick a fight? Are you out to 
you know, work with your advocates? Are you just trying to build your own digital reputation? Those are all things to think about when, you know, before clicking that button that says post or tweet or whatever. Um, and I think that's part of the guidance that, that we've talked about a little bit today, and I certainly spend a lot more time in the book um, talking through kind of chapters three through six are all about that. Well, what do I have to say that's really meaningful, and who do I want to say it to, and what does it mean when I do it? So, um, so yeah, so this slide is just kind of highlighting the, um, the contents of the, the book about uh, product management and social business, uh, why and who and how. And, uh, you know, I wrote this book as an extended case study of what we've done at IBM and what I've personally done. Uh, and it's been good to me. <laughs> I, my, I grew from an individual product manager at the start of the journey to running a business that uh, is pretty significant for IBM uh, about the time that I wrote the book. And um, it's, uh, it's pretty candid. So I know people think, oh, it's a book from IBM and from IBM Press, and so it's all sanitized. And actually, it's not. Um, there are some examples in there of things that we didn't do right. There are examples in there of things that we should have done differently. Um, there are things that go a little bit even off policy uh, at times. So I, I nod towards the IBM social computing guidelines all the time, but every so often there, there's time to break the rules even. So we'll talk about that in the book a little bit. So um, great resource in the book. I'm happy to engage in further conversation. Of course, here on the webinar, uh, we'll take some questions here for a bit, but then also uh, following up from the, from the discussion today as well. So, Cindy, I guess I'll turn it to you to take uh, the questions, and we'll see what we got here. Great. So, there are a few questions having to do with how to get buy-in. Um, is, is, so, here's a specific question. Is there any data we can show our management uh, to prove that it's the product people who should be helping with social media posts? Yeah, <laughs> the the holy grail data, right? Um, I, I think that the the chart that I showed about um, uh, activation or conversion, kind of the bar chart, uh, it, the chart by itself doesn't explain it, but the verbiage around it is also described in the book. Um, for example, there was a, a six week period in June of last year where we did an experiment um, through my blog, through edbrill.com, where we put a tracking code in the blog said, any hit that went to IBM.com from here, we're going to track and see what that user does. And during that six, weeks period, six, week, six week period, edbrill.com was more effective at activating offers on IBM.com related to my products than all of our marketing techniques combined. So, <laughs> um, so having that unique, authentic voice out in the market was more successful than everything we spent dollars on in marketing. Now, that's not good for me because I've since moved on to a marketing role, um, but we've learned from that, right? So we know that having that, that voice from the, the directly from the team that's building and, and delivering the product uh, in the market matters because it drives more engagement than any other method. So the, the authentic voice plus the, the people who are hands-on in the product talking yep. about it. And, the, and there's the irony, because if you're hands-on building or forwarding the product, uh, you may not also be a good writer, or you, you may not have that habit in place to be blogging. Sure, that's true. Um, I often used to say that I thought bloggers were born, not made, that it was something in somebody's DNA that they wanted to do it or not do it. Um, and in chapter three of the book, I even admit that when I started doing some of this, it was for my ego more than anything else. Um, but over time, what I learned is that humans want to talk to other humans and that by bringing our humans to the market, that we could establish a successful voice. And so the example that I was just talking about of the 19 day period in June is on page 79 of the book. Um, so, you know, there is real data. Um, and I think the sales example, too, is another really good data point, right? Those salespeople are more successful because they're able to get direct access to information from product management. So great. So the, the answer to probably all, uh, most of these questions are in the book. So uh, keep <laughs> the questions coming in to be entered into the drawing. So here, here's another question. What if we are in the business of selling products that are worth millions of dollars, which I think IBM is also. Um, <laughs> however, they're very specialized products where only a small set of customers um, actually buy them. Um, mm -hmm. So does it still make sense to leverage social networks to discuss uh, specific projects and products? 
I think that's a really good question. Yeah, there is definitely the, the niche market issue versus a, a broader market appeal. And I think that uh, there's, there's still an audience, right? There's still a set of people you want to influence. Um, maybe it's a, a technical product and you're trying to influence other members of the IEEE to make something a standard. Uh, or, you know, it's a highly scientific product and you're trying to influence other researchers to do similar kinds of research. I think it's a, uh, a case where even in a small lake, all boats rise equally through more water, right, through more participation. And so I think there's a, there's a case to be made even in small microcosm industries that more participation is good for that industry, no matter how small it is, um, to, to get people to understand more of the value propositions and the capabilities of a, a product or service. And, and to that point, so, so recognizing that social networks would work for consumer-oriented goods, but say MRI machines or large telecom switchers or l- large earth movers. Um, I still think that, I, I think that there are opportunities. I'm not convinced that it will have the same, you know, sort of order of magnitude impact, but there's not, there's also no downside in trying it and seeing what happens. Right? And I think that's key also because they may not be on Facebook or Twitter, but they may be reading uh, curated content on other blogs. Um, right. There's a lot of different channels. Yes. Okay, let's see. So is there a way to use social media data to provide product management metrics? So, I mean, that's harder, and you asked me that before we got started, but that is, that is definitely harder because I think product management is measured by different things in different organizations. In my organization, I tend to primarily measure people by the results delivered to the product. Are we shipping and are we making money? And so those are the only two metrics that really matter to me as a product management exec. Uh, I'm not as concerned about defect rate or... Um, some of the other factors that are more, you know, driven by my lab team, for example. But I think it, it depends because different product management organizations are measured by different metrics. Um, hard to show a direct correlation between social and, say, revenue, for example. It's always something people are asking me for. That's why I like that inside sales study. Um, over the years, what I've used to demonstrate that point is not so much the actual social activity, like, okay, now I have 6,000 followers, therefore we're making more money. Clearly not. Um, but instead it's the, I had 27 sidebar conversations from people I had never met before through LinkedIn or through my blog or whatever that led to these sales opportunities that led to this business. So you have to be willing to track and follow up and prove. Um, but I think the data can ultimately be there. Great. So in a specific launch for a new product or a new significant feature? Do you have a checklist of the social interactions to think about when preparing for a launch? We do. I, I'm personally a little hesitant to just go down the checklist every time, though, because I think that that runs the risk of not being authentic. Um, you know, we did a, a launch in my own team in the last few weeks, and, uh, you know, somebody said, oh, well, we created an Instagram account. We pay- posted a bunch of pictures from the event on Instagram, so, you know, check, we did that. Well, you know, sorry, so far, at least a couple of weeks ago, that Instagram account had, you know, five organic followers, 25 others from IBM, connected to it in some way, shape, or form. Uh, but getting five net new people to watch a new channel of our content on Instagram, I don't consider that a success. But it checked a box on somebody's marketing plan. So, um, so I just I caution to be careful of, yes, you can build a checklist like that, and there are clearly some things that are more obvious than others um, around the, the major social media channels. Um, and I talk about those quite a bit in Chapter 7. But I, I wouldn't make that to the exclusivity of new things or specialize things in a particular industry. Uh, you know, if you're in the travel industry, doing something on TripAdvisor is relevant, but it's certainly not to me. Or if you're in, 
you know, the restaurant industry doing something on open table might be relevant, but you know, it's certainly not in others. Right. So you got to understand your channels and make sure that your checklist is, is not just everything, but the relevant things. So uh, this, this is a tactical question regarding a specific checklist, I guess that you would include when you're building a marketing requirements document or a launch document. And so those kinds of checklists about what all the social media available are, um, you can go over to demand metric and pull down a checklist or just search on um, uh, strategic content marketing. So. Yeah. The, yeah. I mean, it, it can be a fairly standard part of building the, the launch plan or the, the MRD in the first place. Absolutely. Yeah. So in your experience, what has been the most effective channel that you've seen the most responses come from? Um, was it Twitter? Was it Facebook? Was it message boards? And I, I would think this would also, the answer would be contextual. It is very, very much so. Um, I used to think it was Twitter, um, but I see that, that, starting to to run out of steam a little bit. I don't know if that's just my industry or my job or whatever. Um, like if I look at my clout score, not that I obsess about stuff like that, but I looked at it, happened to look at it yesterday because they finally worked in Instagram into cloud influence. Um, it says that 51% of my interactions are coming from Twitter. Uh, another 40% are coming from Facebook and then the, the rest from anywhere else. Um, Facebook clout doesn't measure correctly because I have both a personal page and a, and a like page or fan page, and it can't measure both of them. It can only do one or the other. Um, so, you know, one or the other of those channels. But over the corpus of 10 years, actually, my blog has been the most effective because it's not about quantity there. It's about quality. So the comments, the feedback, and the interaction on the blog, some of my blog posts that are 10 years old still get interaction on them through Google or whatever. So I, I think it's that content that best demonstrates the unique voice of a product manager because it's not just 140 characters or whatever, and it can be out there and searched on, you know, for years to come. So then if you're talking about quality, it's a long tail. So if, yes. if you put out good yeah. content, it's, it's going to scale eventually, but also that good content can be uh, positioned across all social media. That's right. So if your product positions in both B2B and B2C, how would you make sure that everyone on the social media channel is engaged? Or do you recommend having separate, ch separate channels for B2B or B2C? Hmm, that's an interesting question because I've spent almost all of my career in B2B. So I, I, I lack a little bit of experience on the, the B2C side. My, my customers and partners have a lot of B2C experience, but I directly have not. I think that they are different audiences because the buyer is different. You know, the B2C is much more of an individual decision and B2B is much more likely to be a key decision maker kind of a thing. And I think that they need different messages. Um, that's where I hope that in the future we'll be able to sort of slim cast instead of broadcast uh, a little more effectively through social channels. Um, so I think that there you have to think about where are the buyers, where are those people hanging out and how do I best reach them? Excellent. So we're coming to the end of the hour. I think we have covered most of the uh, big questions here. So why don't we go to our raffle? And um, and you, your contact, Ed's contact information is available within the slides. The slides will be posted on the AIPMM website under webinars where the original information was, as well as they're available from Ed. And I also post them on my slide share, slideshare.net slash CF Solomon. And the, the drum roll, please. Okay, and the winner of Ed's book, Opting In, is James Lai, Lai, L-A-I. Congratulations, James. Okay, and uh, we'll send you an email with information, I'm, and I'll make sure that Ed gets uh, a hold of it. Um, coming up next week on the AI PMM webinar series is optimizing the product management function. 
So understanding how product management should be set up to work best in your organization and find out how to be a leader to bring that about. On Monday on the Global Product Management Talk, I am talking with James Kennedy, who is the founder of Piehole TV. We're talking about growth hacking with the telephone. Uh, he is from Ireland. He won the Startup Chile uh, contest, so that should be a very interesting conversation. You can listen to archives at blogtalkradio.com slash P-R-O-D-M-G-M-T-T-A-L-K, and I hope to have Ed on the show in the coming months. For the AIPMM, stay connected. Subscribe to their newsletter at AIPMM.com slash subscribe. Follow them, follow the company on LinkedIn. To become a member, go to AIPMM.com slash join.php and find out about certification and upcoming trainings. And definitely tune in to the webinar same time next week for optimizing the product management function with Brian Lawley of 280 Group. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today, Ed. This was excellent, excellent material. And I'm looking forward to also reading Ed's book, Opting In. I don't know if he left, but thank you to the participants. I'm, no, I'm uh, here. I'm uh, sorry. I thought I was still seeing the mute there. Sorry. Uh. <laughs> yep. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no, thank you very much, Cindy. And uh, I'm actually I'm reading a couple of tweets already that have come in during the... Uh, during the the webinar. So I'm looking forward to continuing to engage and uh, I will get the book out to you and to James. And uh, thanks very much. Awesome. And this is, uh, the participants are saying thank you, which is very, very nice. See, you've already raised the engagement level here. So uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, participants. Thank you to the AIPMM for the opportunity. And... uh, Um, Have a great week. 